Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to do it at the old school, as uh, Stefan said, so without PowerPoint. So as philosophers, we don't really use PowerPoints very much. So just run through it. If you don't understand, then you have to speak to the professor after. Um, so I've got two, two, two jokes to uh, open up. Uh, the first joke is that uh, autobiographically, um, I'm actually from Cardiff, but I've never actually lived here. Um, so if that's this an analogy of uh, the human being's uh, relation to time, that would be it, you know. I've never actually been here, but yet we have this immediate relation with it, but yet we don't know what it is. Uh, the second joke uh, concerns Kant. Um, so I'm going to start with Kant and go through to contemporary context of philosophy. Um, so it's quite condensed, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, I'm glad that Donald mentioned the dreaded name, Heidegger. So I've got a quote to open. I won't give it to you in the German, I'll give it to you in the English. Um, so this is uh, Heidegger's The Concept of Time, so 1924, so this actually precedes the being in time. Um, he gave this to um, a theological seminary to a bunch of priests. So he, he says in German, Was ist die Zeit? So what is time? If time finds its meaning in eternity, then it must be understood starting from eternity. The point of departure and path of this inquiry are thereby indicated in advance, from eternity to time. This way of posing the question is fine, provided that we have the aforementioned point of de departure at our disposal. That is, that we are ac acquainted with eternity and adequately understand it. If eternity were something other than the empty state of a perpetual being, the god or deus, were eternity, then the way of contemplating time initially suggested would necessarily remain in a state of perplexity so long as if it knows nothing of God, and fails to understand the inquiry concerning him. If our access to God is faith, and if involving oneself with eternity is nothing other than this faith, this then philosophy will never have eternity, and, accordingly, we will never be able to employ eternity methodologically as a possible respect in which to discuss time. Philosophy can never be relieved of this perplexity. So here we have Heidegger actually favoring for theology over philosophy. The theologian then is the legitimate expert on time. Um, I thank your, uh, your uh, quip. And if recollection serves us correctly, theology is concerned with time in several respects. Okay. So the question of time according to Heidegger in this short excerpt uh, from an earlier lecture prior to his Sein und Zeit uh, is a profoundly theological question that is, in his, is his view, precedes the realm of philosophy itself. In this paper, I shall attempt to firstly give an account of Kant and time uh, in, a, in, 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 in to address the fundamental basis in modern philosophy to which the preceding accounts of temporality and time have shifted then, beginning with Heidegger. So you have to forgive the broad stroke of Kant. If there's some Kantian experts in the room, I forgive, f please forgive me. Um, then I shall address some of the contemporary post-phenomenological accounts in uh, Giorgio Gambin and uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, and suggest that the, the, these accounts of timeless time fall prey to a dialectical critique originating uh, in Adorno, Theodore Adorno, and Max Horkheimer, against Bergson's apparent linear account of time guised as duration. And then we shall move on to uh, Jameson, Frederick Jameson's account of time, in contemporary capitalism in relation to archaeology and new sites of time becoming space. So this is the sort of dialectic that I'm trying to chase, uh, trace. It's a sort of problem geschichte, so it's a history of ideas, but problematizing those history of ideas. So to suggest that our relation to time is no longer the same since the advent of capitalism. Uh, and how, the, how, this, how time in Kant, so how Kant thinks that time is just merely a product of intuition, that objective time doesn't exist, to then how Jameson thinks that time has actually become space, that there is actually no, because we've lived in a, a globalized capitalism, that time doesn't actually exist anymore, which obviously is very contentious. Um, and in addition, the fundamental linkage, uh, linkage between time and the human being. The initial sketches are merely an allegory for the individual presentations of an account of time and, the, and its correlate the, the human subject in order to pre prepare groundwork for a more detailed analysis of Agamben, Nancy, and Jameson. Thus, this paper is a tracing of the dialectic of time and its transformation in its various conceptions throughout time itself. That was a bad joke. Um, and as a result, I hope an allegory may be constructed out of the presence of these texts and thinkers I represent in order to think through time beyond them. So there's two uh, texts that you could maybe note down. Um, there's uh, Espen Hammer. Um, he did a good book, uh, Continental Philosophy and Time. Um, and also um, John McCumber. He also did another Philosophy of Time. I can also talk about, maybe in the questions, um, so we have this continental philosophy, but also I, I, I can do some analytic philosophy of time as well, using physics, if we want to discuss <laughs> that after. Um, so, okay, we'll begin with Kant. Uh, 
For Kant, space and time are merely products of intuition and are not objectively in the world. They are a priori, so without, uh, without reason, subjective conditions on the possibility of the experience. So what he's trying to say here is that as I experience this room right here, it's within space and time, and this space and time condition my realms of possibility, so that I, I can actually experience what's going on. If there was no such thing as space and time, basically everything would be flooding into my perceptions, and I wouldn't be able to deal with it. The mind, the mind structures the manifold sensory information that is given to the senses and organizes them around the faculty of sensibility, so what's given to me. The two primary parts of the transcendental aesthetic of the, uh, the Critique of Pure Reason, 1781, are space and time. He begins with space and time to which the mind organizes the phenomena into. This is the faculty of intuition. <coughs> the mind then, therefore, constitutes and arranges the sensory data into experiences of so-called so objects, so like book, table, do door, you, me, to which our intuitions within the possibility of experience of space and time uh, make these uh, experience of objects to which, th when the, un the understanding structures them according to the transcendental deduction of the categories. So, for example, Kant, uh, Kant begins with space and time, therefore he says that to experience we need space and time, then he says there's objects, then these objects are arranged according to sort of categories of pure understanding which are um, unity, plurality, totality, so let me give an example, so we have one pen and then if I see something that's like this, the same object, then I can say there's pens, so that's one, that's an element of plurality. Um, the latter being the subject of my doctoral works from Kant, so my actual doctorate is on totality. Um, from Kant to Derrida. So these categories are the fundamental b basis by which any sort of human cognitive activity is made possible and any understanding of objects is made possible at all. However, space and time as intuitions figure differently, uh, different values and statuses in Kant's critique. Therefore, time is the form of all intuitions and space is the form of all our outer uh, intuitions. In conclusion, so that was the sort of short run through through Kant, um, in conclusion, Kant's philosophy proved revolutionary and problematic simultaneously for his contemporaries and the generations of literary scholars and philosophers of the next generations. Time in Kant was a major point of contention for, uh, for Hegel, George Hegel, uh, and without delving too heavily into Hegel's crit critique of Kant, uh, he also said that, okay, Kant gives an account of time, what t time, uh, space and time is, but it's ahistorical. It's just saying, okay, time is, 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 is this intuition that structures the mind. But what, what Hegel says is, yeah, but you yourself are in a time and you're also writing about time. That's the critique. Um, Hegel's emphasis on the progression of history as a development of freedom into a future is precisely this process of development of time. So this is what I'm trying to trace from. From the Greek statues of sensuousness to the romantic modes of irony and self-reflexivity. So what I'm trying to say, so you have, you have Greek statues and why do we have different forms of art now? That's what the Hegel's critique of Kant is. You know, well, one of them, anyway. Next, we shall turn to Husserl, briefly then to Heidegger, to synthesize a view of the post-Heideggerian uh, philosophers, Agamben, Nancy, and Jameson. Put succinctly, Hegel temporali temporalized Kant's atemporal account of time. And Heidegger will insert the Husserlian structures of consciousness into time. Within the question of the phenomenological reduction, Husserl seeks a kind of timeless truth within the uh, Heraclitian flux of the pure ego, much like to Kant's transcendental ego. So for Kant, let's try and unpack this a bit. So for Kant, the reason why you know a st subject can remain the, way, uh, the same subject is that there's a sort of transcendental element which remains and, and is able to capture uh, uh, reality uh, within the mind and in the mind. There's something that's uh, transcendental that stays there. Um, and in fact, Husserl calls himself a transcendental idealist, uh, which is very interesting. Um, the presentations of intentional objects are imminent to consciousness, so again, these, this is an intentional object, it has intentions, I have intentions to use it. In so much that the different presentations do not occur all at once, they come in a flow or succession. Thus the continuation of these phenomenological presentations is like the continuously flowing time. The supposed differentiated moments of time to each other is the imminence of time itself. So for example, if I say now, and then I say now, there's a sort of continuity, isn't there? <coughs> um, and that's described as the flow of time in Husserl. Thus, the time synthesis is a passive synthesis in so much as it is not something we do not consciously, or we do consciously, but time confronts us in a complete or finished object of intentional awareness. So for Husserl, time is completely eminent and it's completely natural. The most, ba uh, the most basic awareness for Husserl um, is time, in that the time flowing past the pure ego is an internal time consciousness. So if I just sit there, that you notice this, the flow of time itself. Time, in, in this primordial sense, is for Husserl the most general idos or essence or, or part of the eidetic reduction. 
in Heidegger, so skip that a bit, yeah. Uh, in, in Heidegger, the conception of time has remained since Kant, so we start with Kant and we move forward, a formal conception, and yet we do not possess a ph phenomenological conception of the t phenomenon of time itself, nor in Husserl either. So Heidegger's, one of Heidegger's critique of Husserl in reading, his, uh, in reading Kant is that right, we have a formal conception of time. We sort of abstractly think, like, what is time? And then in Husserl, you kind of get this sort of attempt to make it more like uh, Dase you know, but Dasein being there, uh, making it more uh, commonsensical, more intuitive. But then even in Husserl, there's this idealist uh, uh, substance is left over. Um, where was I? Okay, in Heidegger's conception of the work of art, so this is an example to explain Heidegger's uh, 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 phenomenological conception of time in relation to Z Z Dasein, is the work of art and how it's connected to truth, but not the timeless truth of Husserl's pure ego. Um, can, uh, nor Kant's transcendental subject, nor Hegel's absolute, but as a contingent truth open to the domain of future to come and yet not disclose. So for example, I d Heidegger's conception of the work of art is that right, you have uh, Picasso's uh, Guernica, you have it, it was produced in a certain way by Picasso. Um, it's a work of art in the sense that it's working, uh, it's, uh, it's producing a certain meaning for the culture of its time. Now you go to, say, a Picasso uh, gallery and they say, okay, we have the original like uh, uh, studio of Picasso. It's the original uh, place, uh, seat that he, he worked at. And uh, it's meant to maintain this sort of historical authenticity, isn't it? Like this is the real, but precisely for Heidegger in the work of art, it's no longer a work of art. And this also buys into um, the work of Derrida and Heidegger in the sense that they critique uh, archeology span in the sense that why do we preserve? Why, why do we seek to preserve things? I know that's very contentious, but um, with museums as well, um, for Heidegger and also for Jameson, they see museums as these sort of um, like frozen capsules where it, you know they, these, these things are locked in time. They're no longer working for the people that they were working for, as in pieces of uh, objects. Um, and it's the sort of uh, contemporary context that we have to look at of why are we preserving, say, Greek art? Why are we preserving Roman? Okay. <laughs> of course, this has sort of historical narratives of why we wh why we do this. So now we turn to a detour through. How m how am I doing for time? <coughs> okay. Uh, now we turn to a detour through Adorno and Horkheimer in their critiques of these accounts of time. So, f in short, for Adorno, uh, Kant details the structures and ordering categories of the mind. So Ka Kant is right. You know, he's trying to understand like what are the fundamental conditions and uh, uh, structures of the mind that con you know construct how I perceive things. But not only is his account of the mind ahistorical and atemporal, although constrained by time itself, in the sense that, you know, Kant in the 18th century writing about time is obviously conditioned by his historical context writing about time. He gives no reason of where these particular categories origi originate from and why. So this is the sort of, at least, uh, Marxist trajectory through philosophy of time in saying that, okay, Kant came up with these structures of the mind, but he himself is a middle-class gentleman living in the 18th century and so on. And what, so he, Kant's experience of time is different to, say, a worker's experience of time in the 18th century. That's, that's the critique. Adorno's uh, answer in brief is that the struggle for the assemblage of the mind itself from this century chaos is derived from uh, Marx's concept of labor. In, that in what people perceive and how they perceive time, for example, so who, depending who you look at, is differentiated along their particular time or temporality in which the particular subject finds herself in as a dialectical co consequence. So for example, the worker that works in the factory, say 14 hours a day, hammering the same bit of metal, his conception of temporality is different to say the manager who goes to meetings and whatever else. Therefore Adorno's and Horkheimer's critique of these metaphysical accounts of time and phenomenological reductions of time are misguided and in not, in not differentiating their conceptions from the particular position in which they find themselves and what they occupy as they write about time. Their space, so this is where time becomes space in the paper, or position of their sphere determines or correlates to their conception of time. In essence, this transition to the tying together the analysis of how space determines time and how time itself is conditioned by certain determinations of space leads us into the work of Agamben, Nancy, and Jameson. Now, I think this is where, if there are any questions, this, this is where the questions will come now. 
Um, in the work of Agamben and Ansi, a different account of time is constructed. For Agamben, in, in, inherited from Walter Benjamin and Jacques Derrida in a form of Messianism, so this is where the Jewish theology comes in, Jewish philosophy. He claims that the future is provided by the homo sacer or the sacred human in the ambivalence of the sacred, interpolating between the something that we are not and what we might become as a result projected into a timeless future. So for Agamben, there is basically no time, but the only sort of time that we can sort of uh, hope for is that we can sort of try and change who, who we are and, who, and, uh, uh, and our historical uh, uh, context. For Agamben, uh, language, so this might be some sort of archaeological point here. Uh, for Agamben, language is temporality. So the schism, schism uh, the, the, the splitting um, between the semiotic and semantic when a subject enunciates within a historical context is, is itself time. So for example, when I say now and then I say now, or when I write a text in the 18th century, there's, there's several layers of temporality there. There's the, obviously the, the time I took to write it, the, the time of its publication, and then it's the first generation of readership, and then the second generation, and then all these other temporalities of how texts uh, constitute time. Furthermore, in Agamben, uh, time gains a spatial dimension in the Sovereign's Universal Declaration of a State of Exception, in which the exception as rule becomes the status of contemporary human life. So this is where I get a bit political. So for Agamben, he looks at, say, post 9-11, basically, history changed post 9-11 because the United States declared, you know, uh, war against uh, the uh, uh, terrorism and uh, on behalf of humans. So they declared this universal state of exception where the entire globe basically becomes this one space. Okay. Um, thus for Agamben, violence is not just the problem of activity of representation itself, but the concept formation of the subject, which is involved in enunciation itself, which is inevitably linked to temporality as a result. So for Agamben, when I try to represent something, when I try to enunciate something, whether it be you know uh, writing about heritage sites or writing about the political economy, um, there's inherent violence in it. In the sense, that as, as I try to represent something, you also miss out things, and then this 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 effort to try and represent something is actually temporality. Um, therefore, the Gambon's time is caught between uh, Mesonaic time, which renders impossible life into a law, and also deconstructions deferral of civil signification. The state of exception, as suggested before, uh, takes on a spatial dimension because in order for time to be universal, the same as the state of exception, it must occupy all spaces and all times and spaces as a result. In Jean-Luc Nancy, his conception of time revolves predominantly around Heidegger's conception of mid sign or being with. So we, we have this immediate ethical dimension in the sense that when, when we're born into the world, we have this ethical uh, uh, relation to people. And how the world community since globalization demands universal global ontological responsibility. Uh, therefore, time in Nancy is relegated uh, to the core of Western philosophy in regards to a lost Gemeinschaft or small scale community. So it's another archaeological parallel there, which ever since in Greek origins has postulated this perfect community to which we fell out of and live in an isolated frozen time of isolated uh, uh, selfish individuals. So for Nancy, um, si since the beginning of Greek uh, Western philosophy in Greece, He's saying that we've always had this sort of utopian dimension of like, oh, w we were perfect, say, 10, 15 years ago, and we should always try and return to that. This nostalgic messianism of longing for a time beyond our own, which we are exiled from, Nancy claims that we should be suspicious of, and rightly so. But this messianic return to this longing, in fact, sustains the very situation uh, of timelessness that we find ourselves in. Additionally, Nancy, like Agamben, sees humanitarian intervention in the globalized world as a form of latent sovereignty. So when people, you know, use, uh, say, under the guise of humanitarian intervention, they're actually exercising a form of sovereignty to justify third world and first world, for example. And this obviously sustains the same sort of temporality. In which the sovereign moves across space and time in order to s uh, sublate heterogeneous, <coughs> and, uh, heterogeneous uh, accounts of time into a semblance of order. Okay, now I'm just going to finish on Jameson and I'll conclude. Now, in regards to Frederick Jameson, a fundamental differentiation is made in regards to the practice of cognitive mapping and how time has become space in contemporary capitalism, and in this sense, history is no longer possible. So I'll try and unpack this a bit. So Jameson's analysis of time takes the form as of, of his continuing critique of postmodernism, which poses itself as a heterogeneous type of temporality. Thus, the postmodern space, or how time is now made into space, takes the form of a spatial logic of late capitalism, which is uh, 
in which an alarming disjunction between our perception of our bodies and the imminent situation of ourselves and the constructed environment on the other side. Essentially, Jameson's view of postmodern time, which is the contemporary mode of time in late capitalism, is how time has become timeless and become concrete in space, in which uh, it has infected enclaves, what he calls enclaves, or uh, more sacred parts of the body. Nature and the unconscious are two examples Jameson gives and turns them into spaces of uh, chaotic immediacy of sites of colonization. In addition to these new cognitive mapping or, or, of postmodern time, so how can we understand uh, postmodern time, or space uh, has colonized our bodies as human beings, is the death of narrative, in which narratives are in fact no longer told, dubious and fragmented to an, uh, to an oblivion. So for Jameson in, in contemporary philosophy, um, when he tried to construct uh, a, you know, a history of time or a history of an idea, it becomes hugely problematic. Um, thus, time today is a postmodern hyperspace in which even archaeology and archaeological sites, museums, this is James and not me, uh, and archaeological sites, museums, and galleries are almost kind of a mausoleum. They're, they're already dead, always already dead. Um, for James, and in light of the globalized development of multinational capitalism, and that preserving certain objects of ancient history are a product of certain pre multinational capitalism or capitalist nostalgia or a longing for a time that once was or never was, but we imagine it's an innocent, idyllic time nonetheless. So he's basically saying all these museums that preserve these ancient uh, objects are in fact meaningless, that they're predicated on the present. So the reason why we keep Roman vases is because we have this present idea that we've, you know, at the West we descended from this long lineage. That's the basic idea. Uh, this criticism of modernity and technology in this regard mirrors Heidegger's critique and his, uh, and his calling to a pre-Platonic conception of time um, in that the space of multinational capital is unrepresentable and our individual bodies and human beings can no longer represent th themselves as such. So I think Donald did a better example of explaining this. Um, that, for example, I can have a different experience of time um, walking somewhere as opposed to these technical objects which mediate the experience and they also corrupt it in a way as well. Um, so hence why Heidegger went to go live in the hut um, to get away from this modern technology and bureaucracy. Okay. Um, Jameson's solution to this dilemma of time and space and contemporary capitalism is cognitive mapping, I've said this before, as a political aesthetic, which generally and succinctly means the ability f to form a dialectic or uh, a critique um, to our capacity of immediate perception of time to the totality of a global context in which we can imagine futurities without regressing to former conceptions of time which the postmodern era sustains and without doing the opposite but to the same ends of re reproducing a, a supposedly new form of time which inevitably represents a se false utopianism which postmodern itself also sustains as a result so let me let me explain that a bit so only now do we see at the point of modernity, we see, uh, say, uh, Claude Levi Strauss in anthropology, like looking at these primitive tribes. So only at that precise moment, then we look at these more primitive modes of, of, of being. Um, so it's not like a history doesn't exist in a vacuum. So, for example, I don't, I don't naturally have a, a fascination with Roman vases that I want to investigate uh, Roman vases, but um, it's conditioned by the discourse of contemporary society. Um, Thus for Jameson, the last frontier in capitalist exploitation is space itself. In all forms of the human body, the globe, and even interplanetary uh, ventures into hitherto unexplored spaces. So for example, you know, capitalism is spread globally. The only way it can go is into uh, planetary cap uh, capitalism. So I'm just going to conclude with the Heidegger quote, and then uh, uh, that'll be fine. Okay. So this is the same uh, text, the concept of time. Um, so in conclusion, let us put history and the possibility of repetition to the test. Aristotle often used uh, to emphasize in his writings that the most important thing is the correct education. Original assurance in a matter emerging from a familiarity with the matter itself, so this, we're discussing time. The assurance of the appropriate man of dealing with the matter in order to speak in keeping with the ontological character of our theme here, being time, we must talk temporally about time. We wish to repeat temporally the question of what time is, time is the how, if we inquire to what time is, then one might not cling prematurely to an answer, time is such and such, for this always remains a what. Let us disregard the answer and repeat the question. What happened to the question? It has transformed itself. What is time becomes who is time? More closely, are we ourselves time? <laughs>
or closer still, am I my time? In this way, I come closest to it. And if I understand the question correctly, it is then taken completely seriously. Such questioning is thus the most appropriate manner of access to and of dealing with time, as in each case, mine. That then, Dasein would be being questionable. So in conclusion, I perceive that I've compressed more substance into a short space of time and in a short amount of time in a, covered a lot of space, but I hope I've made clear uh, my, my account. Thank you. Thank you.